What's going on, everybody? Hey, this is uh, this is our this is kind of like our first like big outdoor panel here at Nerd HQ. You guys all super excited for it? Uh, you're gonna have to do way better than that. Are you excited for this? That's, that's a little better. Who's ready for some Riddick? <laughs> I should hope so. Well, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, from Riddick, please welcome David Tui, Katie Sackhoff, and Vin Diesel. <laughs> Everybody, let's give it up for these guys one more time. Hi. So, so we have something uh, very exciting to uh, kick this panel off with. Uh, what do you think that might be? <laughs> Gonna be a little footage? You guys wanna see a little Riddick? Let's play some. machete through some dude's face. That was pretty awesome. I'd like to do that one day. They wanted rated R. <laughs> you asked for rated R, you have rated R. So are we going to, uh, are we going to questions now? Am I getting the nod to, to, to do questions? Yes, is that what we're doing? Yeah? Questions from the audience. All right. The lucky few right here. The lucky few, thank you. Welcome, welcome to Comic-Con, you know? Thank you. All right. Um, Katie, love, I've loved what you've done in the past. And I'm, you know, I know I'm going to love this movie. Same thing with you, Riddick. I followed you from the beginning, from the beginning, you know. And I'm glad to see that you're getting back to what the first movie was, you know what I mean? In the dark, you know, taking on these creatures, you know, with help from, you know, beautiful Miss Katie right there. And, um, and I know that you guys sunk your money into this to make it happen, you know. And what does it mean to you to finally get this? produced out there, ready to go? For me, it, uh, it's been nine years. I mean, when, when David and I went to Universal for Chronicles of Riddick, people don't realize this, but we, we gave the studio three leather binders that were locked. Okay. And they were for three different movies. And we only gave the head of the studio a key for the first binder. Okay. So way back then, we had dreamed of all the places that this mythology would visit. But when we heard from the audience, and ironically, it was uh, David Tui and I doing a, a live chat for my Facebook page. And the response came back um, overwhelmingly one-sided, which was, give us this rated R Riddick. Yeah, okay. They've got Fast and the Furious for PG. That's yeah. the four quadrant. Give us the dark, dark yes, yes. Riddick. And that's somehow uh, through, uh, I guess, sheer willpower um, and being... I guess economical or whatever, we were able to pull off this rated R movie, which is somewhat rare in Hollywood. Okay. Because as you know, when we, when we did the Chronicles of Riddick, yeah. we opened up the mythology, we expanded the mythology, but at a price. Okay. And that was the studio wouldn't release it, uh, wouldn't release a rated R version of it yeah. uh, because there was so much scope. So we really, consciously wanted to return to that dark, pitch black, visceral core. And uh, that's what's so exciting about seeing this trailer. All right, thank you, thank you. Thank you. I got one question for you. Um, Marvel, huh? Can you give me a vision of what that was about? 
<laughs> this is like this is completely opened up. You give me a vision of what that is about. Of what Thanos is about. No. Um, I, I'm, I'm not supposed to say anything. Um, and. So don't. <laughs> Sorry, no spoiler alerts. Not going to happen. Gotcha. Next question. <laughs> Great try, though. I mean, seriously, that, some balls on that guy. That's good. Ben, what's your vision on the next? <laughs> Who's the next question? Hi, right, I guess that's hey. that'd be you. Speak up, please. Good. Uh, this is for David, I guess. Um, the budget for this movie was like $38 million. What was it like, or how hard was it to make a movie of this scope and scale uh, on that little budget? In this well, we do as much as we can with as little as we have. You know, the, um, the first pitch black was made for 22 million. Chronicle is probably, you know, 100 million studio movie. Uh, when you do a studio movie at that level, there's a lot of focus groups, there's a lot of test screenings, there's a lot of opinion. The movie can tend to get, can tend to, can tend to get homogenized. And while that's great for milk, it's not so good for movies sometimes, right? right. So we decided that if we're going to do it, let's do it closer to pitch black have a little more creative freedom, go with the R rating, and just deliver on that level. We'll try to do less, but we'll try to do it better, right? right. So that was the, um, the hallmark of this, and that was the battle cry for this third film, Riddick. So yeah, we're, we're about in that uh, 30 to $40 million range right in there. All right, thank you. Next question. Asking it for this gentleman over there. Uh, he wanted to know in this can, one, can you please speak into the mic? Thank you. He wanted to know uh, for this movie, which uh, aspects of the Riddick character did you want to explore more? Um, there's, there's definitely something very therapeutic about playing this character. <laughs> uh, because for someone like myself who likes to err on the side of positive, I have to go to a very dark place to play the character and a very introverted, um, a, a character that's a recluse. So in preparation, I went up into the country, into the woods, and tried to associate with as few humans as possible. Uh, in part because David Tui was doing something very courageous in this movie, and doing, which when you see the movie, he does something in the first act uh, where th something you don't see that often in films nowadays, you've seen it. I mean, we were calling it the Jeremiah Johnson Act, the Jeremiah Riddick Act, because it's just a character on the planet uh, battling the elements. And so that kind of being on screen that long with nobody else to work off of or to uh, interact with called for somewhat of a recluse-like, woodshed-like process uh, in becoming that character. Um, is that answering the question, kind of? And, and, uh, and, and it might not have gone that way if we would have, we had another script initially. What David was saying was right. We initially had the underverse story which would have been so costly, we never would have been able to make a rated R. So as we were punching through these ideas, uh, we realized that Riddick was destined to make a detour. And that detour was going to put him at face to face with death. So we, we enjoyed taking this Alpha Furion and bringing him near death and watching him struggle to survive. Here, here's what's interesting about the Riddick character for this movie, though, that in this, it's, it's, he's almost an allegory for the franchise because he, as king of the Necromongers, and we do have the Necromonger sequence uh, in the middle of this movie that explains how he got from there to here, right? He, he becomes an allegory for the franchise because there are some people that thought we overreached, we got too big, may have uh, got too slow, in the same way, Riddick is thinking that about himself as king of the necromongers. Did I lose a step? Did I get too fat? Did I come to get too complacent? Did I get too civilized? 
And then when he finds himself stabbed in the back, left on this world, left for dead, he views it not as a setback, but as an opportunity to prove to himself, yeah, that, you know what? Maybe I did lose a step, but now I can get it back. Now it's just me proving myself against this world, which is filled with tooth and claw, right? So if I can survive this, I can survive anything, and I can find the animal side again. So it's kind of cool that Riddick's character is an allegory for the franchise as a whole. And we like that. So we, we embrace that. We recognize that, and we embrace it. Good answer. Good answer. Uh, who's next? I kind of have a statement and a question. Um, first, I was at the panel earlier, and I got to tell you, I've been a Riddick fan for forever. Um, but y interacting with y'all and seeing you and just all that, you guys are so cool. And your intensity is awesome. And it makes me like, it takes my love on a whole nother level. So thank you for doing this for the fans. Um, yay, seriously. Thank you. Like right now, I'm like, yeah, I feel you. Um, and then the other thing, so it's interesting that you talk about being isolated and the character development for Riddick. I want to hear about the space wolf. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? The space wolf? Oh, the dog? Yeah. Space wolf? Yeah. The jackal. The very loved character. With, you haven't seen the movie yet? No, 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 no. No, no, no. I'm talking about for the new one. There's a promo that the promo art. Yeah, with a dog. Yeah. We call it a jackal. It's referred to as a jackal in the movie, but it is yeah. like a space wolf. Yeah. 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 Then the, the, but there's people that are way back there that probably need you to. Oh, sorry, guys. Sorry. <laughs> I'm feeling, see how intimate I feel? It's like, yeah, let's yeah. Uh, see, Can I have another drink? We were having a moment. It's okay, Vin. We were having a moment. We were I got having you. a moment. I, I apologize, I guys. For those back there, I'll we were having us. a little small moment. I Thank apologize. you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, it's um, it's a it's a real special character, this jackal. Uh huh. And uh, I think it plays into what David was talking about earlier. Uh -huh. The relationship between Riddick and this jackal will be will be something you guys will really appreciate. Okay. And, For dog lovers. And it's in <laughs> keeping with uh, you know Riddick having that. He always has a, an affinity with somebody that's been beaten or, mm -hmm. or is uh, abandoned? abandoned or left for dead mm -hmm. in, in the way that you'll see in this movie. Um, but we, we, every time people have seen the movie, they walk out of that movie really in love with this jackal. So I think you're going to appreciate yes. this. Thank you. I appreciate it. Hi. Um, so I just wanted to say, Vin, I love Iron Giant. It's one of my favorite movies. Um, and, and Katie, Battlestar is one of my favorite shows of all time. Um, my question's for Katie. Uh, a lot of the characters that you pick seem to be like strong, independent characters. Um, is that something you seek out, or is that do they just come to you with those characters? Um. You know, it's funny because I actually started in this business in comedy, and um, I kind of, you know, I, I always played the little girl that was always kind of lost and whining and crying, and then I got Battlestar, and all of a sudden I was like the go-to tough girl. They're like, we need someone that can shoot a gun. Just hire Katie. It'll be fine. She'll figure it out. Um, and I am drawn to the characters. You know, I, I um I love the strength of these women. I love trying to give these strong women a vulnerability and give them the, give them layers that makes them um, different than what you would think they would be on the page. Um, so I, I and I'm also kind of a wimp in my own personal life. Um, I tend to um, I call it kvetching, but you might call it complaining um, a lot. <laughs> because <laughs> I'm kind of a baby. So I, I do like to play these tougher characters because I find it um, reminds me, it takes me back to my roots of running around with like my brother and all his friends on a farm and being like a little tomboy. So, um, and I just, I, I like to, I don't know, it's cathartic. I like to shoot guns and punch people in the face. <laughs> Is that wrong? It's wrong. It's slightly wrong, um, but I'm saving a lot of money on therapy. So it's <laughs> totally fine. <laughs> Next, do we have another question? Oh, we're out of questions? 
We can't be out of questions. Katie, question? will you marry me? <laughs> I'm, kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm oh, kidding. Oh, wow. Um, no, he has a question That's how right tough in she front, is. She but you're posing. not by the microphone. What's your question? Uh, yeah, my question was actually for uh, Vin and for David, um, and that is the fact that since you did have the two different budgets, the the first Pitch Black was sort of a nitty-gritty exploitation film that I loved, and then you went completely epic for the second one. So I know you were trying to get closer to the tone of the first film, but how much of the second film did you try to retain in that? How much of what happened to Riddick in that second film plays into this third film? I mean, it's a great question, and it's kept us up many a night. I mean, so much of the development process was dealing with that exact question because there's so many fans of Pitch Black and there are so many fans of Chronicles of Riddick and there's an age gap between the two. Um, anybody that's ever played a death knight in World of Warcraft knows <laughs> what a fucking <laughs> necromonger is and where they got the, the Death Knights from. Uh, just, you know, just to be real here. Uh, just to be real here, guys. We're just we're coming in easy. But, um, and so, my, my point is, we love the mythology, uh, and the, the trick was to maintain the chronology uh, the chronolo chronological order of this mythology, because as you know, if you've seen Chronicle Chronicles of Riddick, we are eventually going to the Underverse. Oh. Yeah! yeah. You quit? Yeah. I've just been told we got 10 more minutes to open up questions for you guys, so I'm just gonna go do what the lovely Katie just did, and I'm just gonna bring down, so who's got a question right here in front? Right here, right here, right here. Uh, Vin, you seem like a guy who really like dives into like passion projects and puts all his all into, like what else, like passion projects are you looking forward to like doing you have like coming up, you know what I mean? Like, Good question. <laughs> <laughs> How does the world know my passion projects better than I do? <laughs> Uh, it's very funny that you say that, by the way, and I'm not supposed to say anything. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> let's just say it's been a long time. We've been talking about Hannibal for a decade. It has been a long, long time coming. And... It's here. <laughs> I, it's like, how do you say something without officially saying something? I think, I think you just did, actually. Yeah, that's, that's, that's good. That's good. Uh, it was a very good birthday yesterday, put it that way. A very, a, a, a very, a very good, I, I felt like I was finally seeing the Alps because uh, uh, it's... Uh, Anybody else up here have a question right now? Yes, I see some hands back there. Hold on. Yes, ma'am, what would you like to ask? Right. Uh, this question's for Vin. Um, I, just wanted to, I just wanted to find out. Uh, hi. <laughs> um, how um, You do a lot of your own stunts, and uh, what do you do to train for all that? Kind of heard that. It, yeah. What, what do you for all your own stunts that you do? Because you're awesome. What do right. you do to train for all that? Uh, it, well, it depends on what role I'm playing. For the Riddick character, it was more about core strength. So I was do, training this core strength uh, regiment with some UFC fighting friends that I have. Um, each role is different. Each role calls for a different kind of training. For, obviously, when you're playing the Dom Toretto character, you have to start weeks in advance uh, actually doing stunt driving so you can imagine how to get weave in and out of traffic, how to take your car and do a 180 into, or a 190 into a camera without killing the crew. Um, all those things you have to work on. Uh, in terms of doing my stunts, I, I, I feel like I'm at the age now, maybe because I have kids, where I'm realizing I might do too many of my own stunts, and I have to be a little bit more responsible so that I could 
deliver movies <laughs> beyond the movie I'm making. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I, I, I started acting in New York, as you know, and um, I, I guess I always felt like the character I'm playing, I should experience some of what that stunt feels like um, to, as an actor, continue out of the stunt while playing the character, if that makes any sense. You, I felt like you, and it started with Triple X. I was doing all these crazy things on Triple X and justifying it to my mother, who thought I was crazy, telling her, but this is my process. How am I supposed to go, yeah, I live for this shit if I don't do it? So, but, but I, I, the answer to your question is now that I have little angels, uh, I'm, I'm trying to be a little bit more responsible. Any other questions up here? Yes, right there, you, sir. Hi, um, I'm like, I love all you guys. Um, how was working with all your coworkers? On this movie, it was incredible working with my, my co-actors. I, I was very lucky that we had such a strong ensemble. Um, you, when you see this movie, you'll see it's, it's, it's actually a trademark of David Toohey's to put people, to put a bunch of different characters in a room, shoot everybody's reaction somehow, and kind of tie it into the story. It's, uh, you see from Katie, when you see her in this film, you're love for her is going to soar, continue to soar. Uh, Matt Nabel did a great job. Bo Keem did a great job. David Batista, by the way, David Batista, some of the clips from this movie were shown to Marvel and he's gonna be in Guardians of the Galaxy. That's a testament to, um, I guess, everybody's commitment that, that, that's always a good thing for me uh, as an actor, as a producer, to walk on the set and see everybody invested and in owning their character to the degree that while they're not shooting, they're discussing each other's, the relationships between each character to further develop the relationships of the cast. It just really blessed that one of the things I'm really proud of is the cast in this movie. Batista's a real sweet dude as well. He's like, he's great guy. an incredibly kind guy. Great, great guy. Yeah, a gentle he's, guy. He's incredibly hard to look at, though. <laughs> <laughs> totally hard to look at. Yeah. That's a chick thing, guys. That's a, that's a. I'm sorry. That is a girl gonna, thing. That's a kid. That's I'm like, oh my God, you should see his muscles and he was so cute. <laughs> I think we've got time for maybe one more question. One more question. I like you in the hat right back there. Yes, sir. Go ahead and squeeze up there. Hi guys, um, big fans of you all. You're all awesome. Um, I was wondering, so, you know, so all of you started out your careers inside of, sort of like wider variety of stuff, like you did dramas, you did comedies, um, and sort of as it's gone on, you've been kind of focused more on genre and sci-fi and action. And I was wondering, um, you know, do you ever, or is that because that was your like natural inclination? So that's like you went for what you liked, or is it like you kind of found yourself in that and you're like, oh, hey, this is actually pretty great. I'll stick with it. Or how do, how do you feel about being kind of genre people? Well, for me, I, 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 um, I was initially very conscious of getting pigeonholed into action. I did a movie with someone named Sidney Lumet, I did a film called Find Me Guilty. And um, in some way, he made me feel like there was something he said where he, he said, you know, beautiful women, there's been a prejudice in Hollywood against beautiful women, thinking that because they're beautiful, they, it would be harder for them to get an Oscar or harder for them for us to go, wow, look at that dramatic talent. And he said the same could be true for someone that looks like an action hero. And he says, and he, he would say to me, forget all of that prejudice. Uh, the world has only seen this much of what you have to give them. It's okay for you to do action films. 
as long as you're approaching it the same way you would approach a drama. So after that experience, uh, I kind of jumped into the ac action with reckless abandon, and I felt like, I, let them try to pigeonhole me. Let them try to pigeonhole me. Katie, what about you? Um, mine's kind of the same thing. You know, I, I grew up watching science fiction with my dad. Um, the first movie he ever showed me, science fiction and action, uh, the first movie I ever saw was Jaws. I was six. Se second movie was Predator. So um, it became this little thing between my dad and I where we would just fib to my mom and tell her we were watching, like, Care Bears, and we would <laughs> go watch, like, Die Hard. <laughs> like, so I don't know. So I've always been drawn to action movies, but I had a very similar thing to Vin in, in the sense that, you know, after you play somebody like Starbuck, your fear is that you're only ever going to play those characters. And, and, and I kind of sat down one day and thought to myself, if that happened, what would you do? And I was like, have the most amazing career of my life. <laughs> like, who cares? Like, who cares if I shoot guns and punch people and run around and swear and act like one of the boys in every one of my movies? It, it doesn't make my career any less important. It doesn't make it any less fun. And I just, I like that stuff. I can't help it. I like it. I cry enough in my personal life. I don't need to see it in, in my professional life. So, no, I love it. I, 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 I do. Action and science fiction are in my blood, so. And David? Uh, you know, I like science fiction, but, you know, I want to try to do it every other time out of the gate, not every time out of the gate, because, you know, it's a big commitment to do a movie with 850 visual effect shots like Riddick has, right? It's a two-year, hands-on, handmade experience if I do this. I've got to design spaceships at the beginning. I've got to design creatures at the beginning. I've got to find the right talent to help me with that. And then I've got to nurture it all the way through the pre-viz stage to the post-viz stage. And hopefully it turns out well on the screen. So it's a big time commitment as opposed to something like if I, if I knock off a little thriller, a little twisty, little twisted thriller like perfect getaway in between, I like that. I like that because it's almost a sorbet film for me. I, it's more about just acting and being with the actors and getting closer to the actors and shooting less green screen. So I like it both. I like the balance of, of going for it in a really geeked out genre way and then backing off a little bit and do, doing something just uh, a little simpler and a little more maybe twisted, you know? If I, if you guys don't mind, I'm I'm not I'm not I'm not in Riddick, so I, so I'm just but but if I could offer just one sentiment, which is, I think working in sci-fi and fantasy and genre is part part of the reason why I enjoy it so much is because of you guys because there is not like a comedy con, there's not a drama con, there's I mean maybe there is I've never heard of it, but but genre and sci-fi and fantasy is you guys. You guys love that stuff, and we love being able to bring that stuff to you, and, and the passion that you give us for the stuff that we get to make is, it's unparalleled. So thank you guys so much for coming here today. Let's hear it for David and for Katie okay. and for Ben. Make sure you all go see Riddick when it comes out. Thank you guys so much for coming today. Thank you, thank you. Let's clap them off the stage, everybody. Keep giving them love. Keep giving them love. It's awkward picture time. It's awkward picture time. Come on, keep it going, keep it going, keep it going. Woo! <laughs> yeah. Thank you guys again so much for coming to Nerd HQ. I hope that you will continue. Oh, yes, sir. Here, here. I just want to say, when you see this Riddick, you are going to write to David Tui and say thank you because he kicked ass directing it. Thank you guys so much for coming. Please feel free to hang out. We got video games and stuff to play with and things to drink and eat and all that. And keep coming to panels. If you haven't seen a panel with us already this weekend, other than this one, of course, come and, and uh, I love you all and God bless you and, and have a great day. Bye. <laughs>